a good morning from the International Institute for Strategic Studies and welcome to this webinar on the war in Ukraine and its wider impact on the Eurasia region. Uh, my name is uh, Benjamin Petrini. I'm a research fellow in the Conflict, Security and Development Program here at the Institute. Um, our program monitors armed conflict globally. Uh, we analyze the implications on countries' uh, peace and development trajectories and the implications for international security. Our team curates the Armed Conflict Survey, which is a yearly publication that surveys and compiles all data around the major armed conflicts globally. Today, I have the, the, the pleasure to, um, uh, to conduct this uh, second regional risk outlook uh, seminar that is part of uh, a, a series, a webinar series, where we want to explore uh, the political risk factors and the areas of fragility at the wider uh, regional level. We, we, in parallel, we conduct uh, conflict briefings at the country level or, or sub-regional level, um, but here today we want to analyze like, the, the, the wider, uh, wider region. This is the second of our series after the, the one on, on Latin America. Um, our, our, our idea and our aim is uh, to analyze the impact, implications of, of current armed conflicts on, on regional security, and have a forward-looking um, uh, mindset and outlook on, on the region. So, on to the Eurasian region. Uh, obviously, the war in Ukraine is dominating um, the Eurasia regional space and, and beyond that. So our conversation today would necessarily be framed around the impact as well as the implications of the war on the different uh, sub-regions in the Eurasia uh, space and the associated countries. Um, we're going to do a survey on the whole Eurasia region and how the war and Russia's posture uh, is impacting its relations with the countries in Central Asia, the Caucasus, Eastern Europe, uh, and the Balkans. And we want to answer questions uh, including to what extent is the war changing the priorities uh, in some of the countries in the former Soviet space? What countries are aligning with Moscow and which one are defying its stance? And especially what risks are emanating from either one of those two uh, attitudes? Now, we have an excellent uh, panel of experts to unpack some of these uh, uh, questions. Uh, here next to me, we have uh, Dr. Nigel Gould Davis, that I'm I have the pleasure of sharing the room with uh, today. Uh, Nigel is the editor of Strategic Survey, the annual assessment of geopolitics, and is a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia at IISS, conducting independent research and writing extensively on the politics, economics, and security of the former Soviet Union. Prior to joining the IISS, Nigel taught and conducted research on international relations in Asia. From 2010 to 2014, he held senior government relations roles in the energy industry in Central and Southeast Asia. And from 20, 2000 to 2010, he served in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, where his roles included serving as head of the economics department in Moscow, ambassador to Belarus, and project director in the strategy unit. He's the author of Tectonic Politics, Global Political Risk in the Age of Transformation. Welcome, Nigel. I also have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jennifer Brick Murtazashvili. She's the founding director of the Center for Governance and Markets, an associated an associate professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh in the US. Her research 
focuses on issues of self-governance, security, political economy, and public sector reform in the developing world. She's a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's the author of, of the following uh, volumes, Informal Order and the State in Afghanistan, and Land, the State, and War, Property Institutions and Political Order in Afghanistan. Welcome, Jennifer. I also want to introduce Dr. Dimitar Beckel, who is affiliated with uh, Carnegie Europe and lectures at the Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. He specializes in the international politics of Eastern Europe and Eurasia. He's the author of Turkey under Erdogan, another volume on historical dictionary of North Macedonia, and rival power, Russia in Southeast Europe, as well as he's the co-editor of Russia Rising, Putin's foreign policy in the Middle East and North Africa. Welcome, uh, Dimitar. And last but not least, our colleague, Dr. Tornike Gordadze, who is a senior fellow for statecraft and influence networks at IISS based in our Berlin office. He analyzes the different vectors and modalities of influence that draw their origins from authoritarian states and represent a challenge to liberal democracies. Before joining IISS, Tornike was senior advisor for research and education at the French Institute for Higher National Defense Studies. He was also professor at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, Science Po. And from July 2010 to October 2012, he served as Georgia's state minister for European and Euro-Atlantic integration and was the chief negotiator on the EU-Georgia Association Agreement and deep and comprehensive free trade area negotiations. Welcome, Tordike. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll start. We will have a first, uh, just uh, some housekeeping rules. We will have a first uh, set of remarks by our speakers. Um, and this will be followed by a Q&A session. Uh, you can ask your question by um, putting, um, writing your question directly in the Q&A function, and I will ask uh, the question on your, on your behalf. The webinar would last for, for one hour. So if I can uh, start with you, uh, Nigel, if you um, wouldn't mind setting the stage for us, obviously, on how the war uh, the Russia's war in Ukraine is impacting the whole region, and specifically not only Ukraine, but Belarus, uh, that, that is a country that obviously you know well, and, and, and set the conversation. Mm -hmm. Over you. to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. So when we had the launch of the armed conflict survey late last year, uh, I noted that uh, at that time, although we were coming up to the 30th anniversary of the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was no sense in which that big bang the end of 1991, had produced a, a new and stable solar system of, uh, of successor uh, states, so to speak, that there was continuing evolution and change and forces of instability, both within and between uh, many of uh, those 15 successors. And so it has proved, uh, and uh, there could hardly be a more dramatic illustration of that than the outbreak of the biggest uh, land war that Europe has seen since 1945. Now, war is always uh, a supreme test of societies, of their cohesion, their morale, uh, their effectiveness. Uh, and that's true both of the perpetrator, Russia, uh, and also of the, uh, the state that's been aggressed against Ukraine. But there's a whole range of secondary uh, effects that are, are shaping uh, the whole region, and that will together uh, discuss over the next uh, hour. Just uh, I mean, very briefly on Russia itself, the outcome, of course, militarily hangs in the balance. This is day 85 of uh, a war that Russia still does not officially call a war uh, and expected to be over very quickly. It's, uh, it, that's not been the case, of course. There have been many surprises in this, uh, this bitter conflict already. Whatever the ultimate outcome on the, the battlefield, whatever the shape of ultimate peace, 
Uh, the war is already imposing strains and pressures domestically on Russia itself, in particular as a consequence of the unprecedentedly severe set of international sanctions imposed on Russia, which will exert cumulative uh, pain uh, over, over time. Uh, it's in effect a tsunami that's about to fall uh, on the country. Uh, and also, and partly as a consequence of that, it will challenge the cohesion of Russia as those costs, both of blood and of treasure, are increasingly felt. And that will affect the, the alchemy of mass opinion, but also affect the cohesion of elites as well. So in, if we're looking at the effects of the wider effects of conflict domestically, watch those, those factors. In terms of their effects on, on some of the other countries, particularly to, uh, to Russia's West, then, uh, of course, obviously, this has been a devastating uh, uh, assault on uh, Ukraine, uh, an existential threat for it, that it has appeared to have staved off successfully the worst consequences uh, of. Kiev is, is, is secure now, it seems, although I doubt Russia has, has abandoned, in principle, the aspiration to, to, uh, to overthrow uh, the, uh, the, the government. Uh, the effects already on Ukraine's economy are severe indeed, for many reasons. The sheer physical devastation of the war, the, national, of the destruction of assets, the national mobilization uh, that's required from a, from a peacetime civilian to a war economy, the outflow of around 13 million uh, refugees uh, at this point. Plus also this smothering, suffocating effect of Russia's control of some of the, 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 the uh, Ukrainian ports, especially on the, uh, the, the southeastern part of that um, southern coast. Uh, and those, uh, those, uh, those, there's every reason to think, unfortunately, those economic uh, effects will intensify. Uh, one question worth raising, it's, it's too soon to know the answer to now, is what effect this war will have on Ukrainian society? Wars change every aspect of a country, especially major wars. It, uh, Ukraine is unlikely to emerge uh, into a, 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 a post-war peace in the same condition as it entered into it. War changes, shifts national moods and agendas and priorities. It undermines old interests. It creates new ones. Uh, so in terms of the longer uh, term effect of the, of the war on, on, on stability and cohesion, uh, let's see what happens there. Uh, Belarus is de facto a co-belligerent, although Belarusian uh, troops are not fighting uh, in Ukraine, against Ukraine, uh, uh, together with Russians. Uh, Russian troops have, of course, been stationed in uh, uh, Belarus, launched uh, a major axis of attack from uh, Belarus, uh, and, uh, uh, and the Lukashenko government there entirely isolated from the West even before this happened as a consequence of the, the peaceful uh, uh, national uh, demands for change after the August 2020 elections and their brutal suppression. A number of uh, steps that Lukashenko took after that to, to burn bridges with the West in a way he had never done so before, that let him, left him dependent on Russia. Uh, Lukashenko government is supporting uh, Russia while still trying to preserve elements of independence. The interesting point there, I think, is that Belarusian society, it's quite clear, is, is not supportive uh, of uh, a deeper Belarusian uh, involvement in this conflict, to the extent that we've had some very courageous uh, campaigns of uh, sabotage and disruption of the Belarusian railway system to hinder the mobilization of Russian troops in Ukraine. Uh, against Ukraine. Uh, the, U Ukraine has actually thanked the Belarusians have done that, and these, these actions have been carried out both by virtual means and also by physical means. So active steps taken by Belarusian citizens to, to make it harder for Russia to aggress against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, Moldova is, of course, watching very carefully uh, with its long uh, uh, border that it shares with Ukraine. Uh, the particular concern there that has emerged, especially since mid-April, has been a series of still mysterious and unexplained uh, attacks in Transnistria against uh, military targets, uh, and again in uh, uh, mid-May, uh, a renewal of those. 
a uh, great deal of speculation about what that might be, possibly a so-called false flag attack by Russian special forces to provoke some instability or provide an excuse for uh, Russia to begin some kind of campaign against Moldova. And the comments of the, uh, the acting uh, head of the Russian uh, Central Military uh, District uh, talking openly about Russia's aspiration to extend its control all the way uh, west across uh, Belarus to Transnistria has stoked those concerns. Uh, enough concern uh, within uh, Moldova to cause uh, President Sandu to call a, a, a special meeting of the Security Council. Uh, that situation has not deteriorated, but certainly an element of this to watch. And it reminds us, in conclusion, that we have to see all of these countries as, uh, to a degree, interlinked into a, a, a single strategic space when we are trying to think about the, the consequences of, the, uh, uh, of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel, for this very comprehensive uh, um, survey of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the setting the stage on the conflict and on some of the countries here involved. I, I, I liked how you draw sort of a thread between uh, uh, the, the conflict today in Ukraine and how this is a legacy of, uh, of, the, of, of, of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And, and, and so this is sort of like a story that um, that, that has a continuum, and it's not something that started today or just in 2014. And I like how you draw attention, actually, to the post-war phase, which is something that here at the Institute we have, uh, we have a specific interest in understanding what the opportunities are uh, once uh, major and if mili major military operations uh, end. Um, let me turn to, um, uh, to, 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 um, to Dr. Murtazashvili. Um, can you give us a, a sense of the impact and the implications for the Central Asia? Uh, region from from the war and how um, the region and the countries in the region are are, are perceiving uh, this war. Over to you. Sure, great. Thank you very much, and it's wonderful to see uh, so many old friends and meet some new ones here today. Uh, so, a uh, real pleasure to be here and to talk about what's going on in Central Asia. And and, and I think we should look at the effects of Central uh, of of this war in Ukraine as having a really a uh, definitive and strong effect on relations between uh, Central Asia and Russia. And for the past several years, this relationship had been creeping very, uh, a, a bit closer than it had in years past. If we look at what, and, and so what we're seeing now is a very interesting fissure emerge between uh, Russia and Central Asia and uh, countries in Central Asia really taking their independence and their sovereignty very seriously. I mean, they have in the past, but I think that this is really representing uh, a new juncture in, in history uh, of these newly independent republics. And let me talk a little bit about why. Um, we recall what happened in Kazakhstan in January when uh, the CSTO, the CSTO forces really led by Russia came into Kazakhstan to support uh, the government of Tokayev that seemed to be at least under threat for the time being. And many analysts, myself included, thought this was a very risky move on the part of Kazakhstan because Kazakhstan was essentially giving up a bit of its sovereignty to Russia by asking CSTO forces to intervene in what really appeared to be a domestic dispute. So it was very surprising, I think, to many of us how quickly Kazakhstan came out to condemn uh, Putin's speech uh, you recall the, the famous speech that Putin gave even the night before uh, the invasion began. Kazakhstan said they do not recognize uh, Luhansk Republic. They didn't uh, recognize um, you know, any of the actions in Donbass. Um, they didn't recognize those as independent republics. They said that very, very swiftly. They came out quickly to recognize the sovereignty of Ukraine. And this was followed a, a few days later by Uzbekistan, that made, uh, whose foreign minister made the same statement. 
Uzbekistan too had similarly been moving a little bit closer to Russia in the past several years, had been entertaining membership in, in the Eurasian Economic Union. And so we had begun to see, uh, you know, Russian, I wouldn't say the word hegemony, uh, but certainly Russian influence becoming much more pronounced in the region. The move by leaders to quickly condemn Russia really put a strong sort of barrier uh, between these republics and Russia. Uh, the only one that sort of, uh, we, we saw Kazakh, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan somewhat uh, waver on this, but their economies are so much more dependent upon Russia for uh, remittances. So about a third of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan's budget um, sorry, GDP comes from um, economic remittances from, uh, from Russia, and obviously those republics have a lot to lose. But in the past several weeks, we've also seen Kyrgyzstan sort of move a bit closer to the positions of, uh, Kaz of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So we're seeing a real severing, I think, of relations. Um, not complete severing, of course, but a really a new episode, I think, in the history of relations, which leads us, I think many of us should be asking questions about what is the future of the Eurasian Economic Union. You know, there had been talks of this expanding to include Uzbekistan. There had been enormous pressure put uh, by Russia onto Uzbekistan to join. I wouldn't be uh, surprised to see the EA, EU sort of dissolve. You know, one of the reasons why is that Russia had uh, so shortly after the invasion of, U of Ukraine, uh, Russia had uh, banned the export of things like uh, sugar and wheat to EAEU members. So many of the Eurasian Economic Union members were saying, well, what is the point of this economic union if we're not actually going to use it in a time of need? And so another thing that we should look at is that the effect this war has had on the economies of Central Asia and as very poor economies this war is going to have a much more pronounced effect on, on these countries. So we're seeing um, the Kazakh currency has lost around 20% of its value. The Tajikistan currency has lost around 35% of its value. Uh, Kyrgyzstan has rebounded a little bit. Uzbekistan's currency has remained um, uh, you know, somewhat more stable. But I think now countries in the region really are beginning to see Russia as much more of a liability than they had in the past. And this doesn't mean that Central Asia is going to become, you know, under the influence of China automatically. I think a lot of people mistake uh, foreign policy in these regions as sort of this great game competition between China and Russia and then the United States whenever the United States seems to be paying attention. Um, what we're seeing here is a newly assertive Central Asia, and this is very interesting. The republics uh, in the region, I think this is, a, this is a new dawn for many of them. They have the tools and their own foreign policies to play Russia and China, for example, off against one another. It's a real opportunity for a lot of creativity. And I think if Europe or the United States wanted to engage more constructively in the region, there's a real opportunity here. Unfortunately, Central Asia for Europe and the United States for the past you know, couple of decades has just been sort of a backwater to, the, to their Afghanistan policy. Um, and we're also seeing you know, huge effects of this war on Afghanistan as well in terms of wheat prices and so forth, uh, making a humanitarian crisis much, much worse. Uh, so those are things that I would certainly be looking out for in this region as we go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... For these uh, for these remarks, and I find very interesting your uh, your initial point of how the war uh, paradoxically has strengthened the sovereignty of of these countries, and and obviously we should not remember that most of the Eurasia uh, uh, space and definitely the whole uh, Central Asia is made of 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 newly independent countries. I mean, 30 years in, a, in the history of a country is not. Uh, um, is not a lot. So these are obviously the state formation process. It's 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 definitely an ongoing one in this uh, um, in this region. Um, let me uh, let me uh, turn to uh, my colleague uh, Tornike for some uh, reactions uh, um, uh, on the implications for the Caucasus um, from uh, from uh, the war uh, in Ukraine. Tornike, over over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for uh, 
for inviting me. I will um, uh, try to um, uh, answer two questions. First is the the, the actual impact of this war uh, on uh, politics, um, economic society of the three uh, South Caucasian states, um, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. And then I will try to uh, um, uh, discuss uh, a little bit the, the prospects about the protract, protracted or frozen conflicts uh, in this zone. Um, so I will start um, uh, with uh, Azerbaijan. Um, and uh, before uh, uh, talking the, the, the exactly the war that, the, that is uh, actually uh, taking place in Ukraine, um, I would like to, re uh, to remind you that uh, in 2020 there was a war uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan that the Azeris call the Second Karabakh War, where Russia was surprisingly um, neutral at the beginning, or at least uh, showed a very little support for Russia's uh, traditional ally, uh, Armenia. And I think, and many uh, as people, and some people at least in Azerbaijan think that it was already Russia's attempt to, to gain some kind of loyalty in the perspective of uh, uh, having war with Ukraine, because in 2020, uh, uh, Putin had already an idea about uh, attacking Ukraine, and uh, Putin wanted uh, uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey to be more loyal. Uh, is Russia happy now with the Azerbaijani, pol uh, Azerbaijani position? I don't think so. Uh, at least uh, Russia showed, uh, showed some signs of uh, um, not being very happy. On the contrary, Ukraine is uh, is uh, encouraging uh, Azerbaijan to uh, to uh, continue um, the, its current position. Uh, in in reality, Azerbaijan is not, uh, of course, openly supporting Ukraine. They Azerbaijan made uh, uh, public statements about the respect of Ukraine's territorial integrity, which is the principle that Azerbaijan always supports. And they, uh, but their vote in the in the UN was uh, rather neutral. They abstained from um, from this vote. But Azerbaijan continues. Uh, to support uh, uh, Ukraine in providing um, energy, uh, energy resources, plus uh, not only oil, but oil uh, products. Um, uh, then um, Azerbaijan, um, uh, is, 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 the, the, what will be the impact of, uh, on, on Azerbaijan um, uh, uh, the, of the consequences of this war? Here we can divide the answer in, in two uh, two parts. First, what, what will happen if uh, uh, Russia wins or what will happen if uh, Russia is defeated? Um, uh, if Russia is defeated, Azerbaijan will feel even more confidence. We see the Azerbaijani confidence growing over the last uh, few years. And uh, as uh, Azerbaijan uh, in, doesn't try to, uh, to hide the, the um, the objective of uh, uh, reunifying the whole country, uh, uh, establishing the control all over the territory within its internationally recognized borders, including this part of the Karabakh, this is, which is still not under Azerbaijani control uh, and which is uh, under Russian control, uh, they, they will pursue this goal uh, more openly. Uh, Azerbaijani leadership has uh, al already stated several times that they will, they, uh, they will probably, or they are at least um, showing the hesitations of uh, about uh, prolonging the, the, uh, uh, the presence, Russian troops presence in, in Karabakh after 2025. Uh, is this to influence Russia to have a more um, uh, favorable position uh, for Azerbaijan or to influence also Armenia, some kind of uh, blackmailing Armenia and uh, uh, pressuring Armenia to have a, um, a more uh, uh, realistic demands in the negotiating process? Uh, both can be uh, can be through. Uh, so, but in case of uh, uh, Russia's victory, I think Azerbaijan still have resources to uh, pursue this objective, but in a different way, to, to, to trade, uh, to, to, to start a kind of trade-off with Russia, and Azerbaijan has uh, several things to, uh, to offer to Russia. Now I will move to Armenia. Armenia's current leadership is under pressure. Uh, from the very beginning of the war, uh, Lukashenko made statements that uh, Armenia should join the, the uh, United States of uh, Russia and Belarus. Uh, so as a, uh, the Armenian uh, current leadership is 
um, supporting Russia, but in the dragging their, their feet. In, in, in the UN, uh, they behaved exactly like Azerbaijan, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, the options for the Armenian um, uh, government are, are very limited. Economically speaking, Armenia is benefiting from this war because lots of uh, Russians uh, left Russia. I mean, most of uh, those who left Russia are uh, young professionals. Uh, they are in different um, uh, IT uh, businesses. They, many of them uh, left Russia through Armenia. Not all of them remained in Armenia because more than 100,000 Russians arrived in Armenia after the war started, but they then been, have been dispatched in other countries uh, from Armenia. But Armenia became kind of hub uh, for all these Russians going in the, in the south, southern direction, the direction of the Middle East, or Georgia, etc. And the Armenian economy benefited from, from this. We can develop it later if there are questions. Um, uh, uh, but uh, politically speaking, uh, Armenia's opposition is very much pro-Russian and uh, criticizing the, the, the current government for not being very actively supporting uh, Russia. And uh, But there is also a part of the opposition that is uh, more pro-Western. It's represented by six small pro-Western countries, then they are pretty much uh, uh, pro, pro, they have pretty much pro-Ukrainian position. So what will happen uh, if uh, uh, Russia wins or if Russia loses this uh, this war in Ukraine? If uh, Russia wins, there will be more pressure on, on Pashinyan and on the current Armenian government to be integrated in this new kind of uh, uh, Russian dominated union that will emerge uh, after that. And uh, most probably the Russia will attempt to change the, the government in Armenia and to install a more pro-Russian forces there. If Russia loses, this is another problem for Armenia because uh, there can it depends on the level of of, of the defeat of Russia, but if Russia totally loses the war and is forced to evacuate uh, the, the, the Karabakh, there will be a security vacuum in, um, in this region. And uh, uh, Armenia is also preparing for that. And Armenia is trying now to um, revive uh, the, the Minsk group, Armenian leadership, uh, the president uh, uh, traveled in Europe, in Paris, in Netherlands, the Minister for Foreign Affairs was, uh, was in, uh, in the US, and uh, uh, the Armenians are thinking about, uh, in case of uh, this uh, power vacuum, um, uh, after Russia, possible Russia's defeat in, in, in Ukraine to replace Russian forces with some international contingent uh, in this region. Um, uh, so, but in, in both cases, there are uh, uh, risks for Armenia. And uh, as most of our Armenian uh, experts or people close to government say, they would, uh, the ideal scenario for Armenia would be uh, something in the middle, something in the situation that is a uh, kind of status quo that continues. And now um, uh, with Georgia. Uh, Georgia has a, a paradoxical uh, situation right now because uh, uh, in the last uh, the 20 or 30 years after the independence, Georgia had very bad relations with Russia. Georgian 20% of Georgia's territory is occupied by Russia and Georgia's proximity with Ukraine was, uh, uh, was very, very big. Uh, but uh, during this uh, this war uh, and uh, internal evolution of, of the of Georgian politics show that the current government is uh, pretty much into uh, appeasement with Russia uh, and the more this government is becoming authoritarian and more the state is captured by informal leadership of a, uh, of a, of a billionaire uh, billionaire oligarch more Russia is uh, more Georgia is sliding sliding, um, in, in, into uh, Russia's orbit. Ukrainians are very unhappy with Russia, with the Georgia's uh, position. Uh, officially, and in, in the UN, Georgia voted for the resolution uh, condemning Russia's invasion, but Georgia didn't uh, join the, uh, the, uh, the sanctions, and there are uh, lots of um, discussions and criticisms coming from Ukraine and also from the West that Georgia may, ser may serve as uh, uh, to bypass uh, uh, sanctions uh, um, uh, for, for Russia. There are lots of Russian companies opening in Georgia currently. More than 400 companies, uh, Russian companies have been registered in Georgia uh, uh, just to get uh, to avoid uh, the swift uh, um, uh, blockade uh, against Russian, Russian banks. So what will happen with the uh, Georgian conflicts then? Um, uh, currently, I don't think there's a huge risk of uh, uh, another um, 
upsurge of the of, uh, of the conflict in South Ossetia and Abkhazia because first of all Georgian army is not at all ready for for this. Uh, on the contrary, Georgian current government leadership uh, uh, criticizes uh, criticizes Ukraine and even the West saying that they are dragging, they are trying to drag Georgia in, into the conflict to open the second uh, front, but they will not because the main uh, uh, main success of the Georgian government is to, to safeguard the peace. They, they have pretty much the same um, uh, language as uh, uh, Orban in, in Hungary. Uh, so they are not ready. The Georgian president uh, herself declared that Georgia's uh, army was unable to resist Russia for, for uh, the, the, uh, the resist Russia, the Russian invasion possible invasion. So uh, Georgian, uh, um, uh, what, what will be the next? If Russia uh, wins the, the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's influence with Georgia will, will be uh, much more stronger, and the current government will not resist this uh, reinforcement of Russia, Russia's influence uh, uh, in Georgia, because they are already uh, showing some signs of uh, uh, criticism toward the West, and uh, uh, this, um, uh, they refuse to condemn Russia's uh, aggression in, in Ukraine. But if Russia loses, it will depend on, on the level of, of, uh, of the defeat. First, uh, paradoxically, uh, if Russia, as Russia's defeat in, in Ukraine is moderate, uh, the, the risk for Georgia could be even bigger because R Russia could compensate uh, in annexing, uh, for example, South Ossetia and their continuous rumors on discussions about the referendum in South Ossetia to join, join Russia. And this is also a, um, uh, a, an instrument to, to put pressure on Georgia. But if Russia's defeat in Ukraine is, is total and big and if Russia is considerably uh, weakened, then of course the Western influence will, will increase in Georgia. And Georgian opposition is betting on Ukraine's victory and the Georgian government, and they say that the Georgian government is uh, awaiting uh, Russia's victory to, to, uh, to strengthen their, their position. So just to, in one phrase to, to, um, uh, to uh, sum up, uh, Georgia and Armenia are both very vulnerable uh, 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 the, uh, about the impact, um, uh, security impact that can have the, the, uh, the war in Ukraine in both cases, in the case of Russian defeat, in the case of Russian victory. Azerbaijan is pretty confident they would have preferred if, if Russia is defeated because it will help them to uh, reestablish the control all over the, their internationally recognized territory. But even in the case of Russian victory, which is less likely at, as we speak, but still uh, not impossible, Azerbaijan will use other, um, uh, other instruments to, to progress in this direction that is uh, uh, the uh, um, recovering the uh, total sovereignty on the, on the entire territory of Azerbaijan. Thank you. Can you... Thank you very much, uh, Tornike, for this, uh, this survey on the Caucasus. And like what, what emerges so far is that, uh, uh, widely speaking, like the, the war in Ukraine is presenting both uh, risk, but as well as uh, opportunities uh, for, uh, for, 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 for the countries in the, in the Eurasia region. And so we should, uh, that they're all watching with extreme concern, but also with thinking about uh, uh, a, f a future scenario. Um, let me turn uh, last but not least uh, to Dr. Bekhev. First of all, um, welcome to our office. I see you're sitting in our office uh, uh, in Berlin. Um, can you give us an overview of, uh, of the impact and the implications for the Balkans uh, as well as uh, uh, for Tur Turkey from, uh, from the war? Yeah, very briefly, and it's, it's a real pleasure to be here the next to Tornike, uh, at the beautiful IWS office uh, in Berlin. Uh, starting with the Balkans, when the war uh, kicked off in, in Ukraine, uh, there was almost a knee-jerk reaction in, in the region that it looked awfully familiar uh, compared to the post-Soviet space which of course saw conflict in the 1990s. Uh, you, you, former Yugoslavia had a much rougher ride uh, with uh, a major war happening in Bosnia, Kosovo, and other parts of the region. So the wounds of this conflict uh, are still raw uh, and uh, implications, political, economic, uh, societal, are very much in our face to this day. Uh, so when uh, the images of, of war um, emerged from Ukraine, 
it struck a chord uh, in, uh, in, in the Western Balkans. And the question for many analysts was, uh, can this new upsurge of violence spark uh, war again uh, in the Western Balkans? Because certainly there are connectivities, uh, as in the past, but also in, in the present day. Uh, in the Balkans, you have uh, countries like Serbia closely aligned in terms of foreign security policy with, with Russia. You have uh, in Bosnia, part of the body politic, um, looking up to Russia as a supporter. In fact, Russia has helped Republika Srpska remilitarize its police force um, and pushing back on some of the gains in state building. Uh, Russia is influential with the Kosovo Serbs, and also you have fellow travelers uh, in, in, in Montenegro, a uh, part of the government that was in charge at that point, uh, had very strong connections uh, to Moscow. So um, given uh, the wounds of the war, uh, security alignments, uh, Russian presence in the region, um, the risk to many people appeared real that uh, this cross-pollination uh, could, could occur. Now, um, I argued back then, and I've, I still subscribe to this view, and I think the events uh, over the past couple of months have vindicated this view, is that in the Balkans, there are strong forces um, upholding the status quo. So there is no appetite at the level of societies, all the political players or, or likely proxies for Russia to wage war. Uh, you very much saw it uh, in the Serbian elections, where President Vucic, of course, carried the day. I mean, of course, the opposition made gains, but it was his triumph, more or less. Uh, when the war started, his ruling party and he himself changed the electoral slogan uh, to peace, stability, Vucic. So what Tornik has said about the reaction in Georgia uh, but also you see in, in Hungary that the incumbents uh, tried to portray themselves as uh, the ultimate supporters of the status quo, applied in great measure to Serbia. Except that in Serbia, you could say that uh, parts of the opposition were even more sympathetic to, to Russia and actually tried to take Vucic to task over his lack, uh, uh, sort of lukewarm uh, alignment with, with Russia. But this reaction was very much the norm. You saw it also with the leader of the Bosnian Serbs, Murad Dodik, who for years has played this complicated game of uh, threatening to secede from the common state and then taking a step back, but in the process winning more and more autonomy. Now he went to the European Parliament and assured everyone that uh, his intention was not to rock the boat. Uh, but having said that, uh, Serbia and Republika Srpska have made sure that neither uh, country uh, would join the sanctions. So even if there is no threat of violence or spillover, if you will, uh, they will be dragging their feet and, and trying to uh, resist pressure from the West uh, in terms of uh, applying the sanctions, which in the Serbian case is uh, striking, given that it's a, a state negotiating for its membership in the EU. Um, like Georgia, but also Turkey, Belgrade has emerged as one of the places where Russians leaving uh, the country have found safe heaven, heaven. And of course, it's a collection. You have the Liberals, uh, my, some of my colleagues from Carnegie, uh, Russia, which now closed in Moscow, uh, ended up uh, in, in Belgrade. But also you have uh, other agents uh, looking at ways to bypass the sanctions. So Serbia, I think, will be trying to sort of stay in the middle and not engage to the, uh, with, with the Western sanctions as much as is possible. Having said that, on votes or, or, or issues where the cost is relatively low, Vucic has went along with, with Western policy. You saw it very clearly in the vote at the UN General Assembly. So all the resolutions where uh, the aggression was condemned, you could see Serbia uh, sort of joining the, the, the rest 
of the pro-Western group. Uh, you saw it also in the vote for expelling Russia from uh, the Human Rights um, Committee of the UN, which was a bit more visible. Uh, in the vote less visible on terminating Russia's uh, contribution to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, so many of those issues you saw Serbia bandwagoning. Uh, they even went as far as applying some symbolic sanctions. And guess who uh, was the target? It was uh, Viktor Yanukovych and his family. So this is the least important bit of the Western sanctions. And Putin just wanted to give something back to the West. Uh, so right now, he'll be dragging his feet. Uh, there is a government to be formed. He'll say that it's not his brief. It has to be the prime minister. Um, resist uh, joining 100% of the sanctions and, and try to maintain connections to the Russians, but also not uh, taking side in this, this war. But the longer it lasts, the worse it, it will get. So this is this is the main thing going uh, in the Balkans. And it sort of mirrors uh, Turkish situation, even if Turkey is much more of a consequential actor in this conflict uh, by virtue of its membership in NATO, military capacity, geographic location. Uh, Turkey has uh, positioned itself in the middle, trying to be the interlocutor, trying to be the bridge builder. Uh, in fact, um, the Turkish uh, leadership hosted uh, a round of talk, uh, talks between the Russians and Ukrainians early in the conflict. Uh, but the same thing applies to Turkey. The longer the conflict lasts, the more apparent will be the negative consequences, the, the bad fallout. First of all, on the Turkish economy, uh, because uh, high energy prices, and also food supplies becoming more expensive uh, hurts uh, Turkish consumers. Um, next year will be election year for Erdogan, where a lot is at stake uh, for him to stay in power. And the Turkish economy has been in the doldrums with official inflation year on year in the region of 60%, but the likely percentage probably double. So any additional pressure from uh, from the war uh, is, is bad news for, for the Turkish leadership. So it's it's a mixed picture, but the longer it lasts, the worse it will get. Turkey more or less aligned with the West, except for the sanctions. Uh, the Chinese side continues to supply the Ukrainians with, uh, with weapons. And uh, now it's a big question whether they are providing more, more, more bioreactors. Uh, but looking at what military experts have to say, uh, the Ukrainians are now deploying a second batch that they have procured now. Uh, Turkey, of course, has a very clear position on, um, on Crimea. Uh, at the same time, they close the straits for maritime, for military ships. Um, and it benefits from uh, the change of military balance now that the um, the the Moskva, uh, the main ship of the Black Sea Fleet, has been sunk by, by the Ukrainians. Uh, but then again, they will continue with that balancing act. I'll be surprised to see Russia, uh, Turkey implementing sanctions. It's very much the same behavior they exhibited in 2014, also in 2008, trying not to pick a side, trying to talk to both sides and trying to minimize, minimize the damage. And finally, one issue that is lingering now to, on everyone's mind is uh, the Turkish reaction to uh, the, the possible veto on Sweden and Finland's joining NATO. My initial reaction was that it's a uh, usual Erdogan theatrics. He's uh, taking a tough bargaining position and in the process of negotiations, he'll climb down. But we cannot be 100% sure uh, because Again, domestic politics might muddle, might muddle the picture. Uh, he cannot afford to uh, back down. Uh, I think the sum effect will be bad for Turkey because there will be a way for the NATO, from NATO members in the US to reassure the Swedes in defense. Certainly, we've seen the UK uh, offering guarantees to Sweden. So Turkey doesn't have that much leverage. But it has a set of demands vis-a-vis -vis the US, um, notably on modernizing its air force because of the F-16 package. And if the Congress 
um, take some kindly to this Turkish behavior. And there's quite a bit of opposition, like I said, around there. Um, Turkey will be on the, on the losing side there. So that might be even though out Turkey because of the war is seen as much more essential and, and much more uh, of a key player to be courted and accommodated. Uh, longer term, uh, the cracks within the West, uh, with, with the West will become even more striking and apparent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bekev. Um, I first would like to invite our, our audience uh, to um, fill in and ask your questions in the, in the Q&A. But uh, um, let me just a couple, a couple of comments. I mean, we, we have heard from uh, the different uh, subregions in, uh, in Eurasia, and uh, there are heterogeneous responses, uh, it seems. Uh, obviously, everyone uh, is, is very much uh, concerns, but concerned, but there are examples of countries being emboldened by um, by the actions of Russia and in being uh, in, in feeling that they can um, um, bring forward their own uh, their own interest. Um, a couple of questions that I can put on the table, and then uh, anyone can sort of jump in and uh, and and and, uh, and reply and answer. Um, many of you. Uh, pinpointed the economic impact uh, uh, of uh, the sanctions, uh, not only on, uh, obviously, on Russia, but the effect that it's having on, on, uh, on the countries. Um, to what extent we can uh, foresee or think that a protracted conflict would bring uh, political instability and in which, uh, in which countries? Um, the second question is, uh, um, Nigel, you, you, you touched upon how the sanctions are biding Russia's cohesion, um, both in its public uh, opinion, but also in its uh, political elite, um, biding obviously on the country's finances and the war and the human toll is, is obviously um, also uh, uh, being a, a risk factor. Um, but uh, what... Uh, uh, what Russia stands to lose uh, going forward looking at the Eurasia region? I mean, how is uh, Russia, how should Russia perceive uh, these, uh, uh, these, the reaction from the other countries uh, in the region? And this is to you, but also to, 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 to the rest of the group. Um, so, yeah, let me stop there. And obviously, this is a dialogue. So if anyone has uh, reactions on, on what others said, um, Obviously, um, bring that uh, bring that in. Um, do you want to go first, Nigel? Yeah, so thank you. Very briefly. Yeah, the sanctions will bite. I mean, they're beginning to, but but uh, they'll uh, their effects will uh, be felt much more over the coming year than they have been so far. It's really a short mm. short period of time mm. so far for them to mm. act. But we cumulative, and it will spread. Mm. Uh, and it's uh, it's. It's not just, and perhaps not even primarily mass opinion, of that matters, but elite opinion. Mm. Elites are best placed to know what's going on in the country and the, the extent of the cul-de-sac that, uh, that, that, that this invasion has led, led the country down. Uh, and if, if political change takes place within authoritarian states, it's almost always from within rather than from below. So I'd say watch that on sanctions. But to your broader point, uh, Yes, uh, I, I, a, a loss of influence, and I, I very much uh, uh, have in mind Jen's uh, remarks about the impact on, on Central Asia. It is very, very striking. I mean, she was, uh, she's using the, the term, uh, I think, something like uh, watershed or something like that, the sense of a new era. And recall how much has changed, therefore, how quickly. Uh, and we, we've, uh, we've already heard about the what was seen as the implications at the time of Russia's brief uh, involvement in the, the, sort of the, the, the high-level political struggles in Kazakhstan in January, and this perception at the time that there would be a debt for President Takayev to pay back. Go back to last August, uh, after the, uh, the return of the Taliban to Kabul, it seems to me, and, 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 and Jen will, will know best, that there was a view then that Russia's offer as a security provider to Central Asia uh, got some sort of second wind. There's a renewed interest in it then. So there's two markers 
just within recent months, both of which played to Russia's advantage, it seemed at the time, and were sources of growing potential Russian influence and resurgence of Russian influence. But now this, uh, the invasion has thrown the switch in the, the other direction, and that the swiftness and de decisiveness with which major Central Asian states rejected the, the recognition of the independence of the the next one will have right. Really, really striking. It seems to me not keeping their heads down, but actually making, setting out very clear markers. And as, as Jen says, it's, uh, uh, they are subjects, not objects. Uh, so these tired tropes of great game and so on, as if they're bits of territory and peoples, but great that other more powerful external actors to kind of bargain or war over. If you put that aside, these are countries making their own choices and decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Uh, Jennifer, over yeah, to I'll you. I'll just uh, jump in very briefly because I have to run at the top of the hour, unfortunately. But just to, uh, you know, to reiterate this, that, uh, you know, in, in terms of future conflict, I don't necessarily, I mean, unless Russia decides to invade Kazakhstan, for example, I don't really see Russia as the source of more domestic conflict, for example, in Central Asia. I mean, one of the things we're actually not talking about right now is there's enormous unrest in Tajikistan that's unfolded over the past several days. And this is, um, uh, you know, in, in the gorno badakhshan uh, province in this area has seen increased unrest in, in the past several years. Um, and it's really quite violent and we're not paying attention to it because, you know, our eyes are are uh, looking elsewhere. But, you know, something else to think about long term security issues, you know, CSTO or the Russians, you know, the, the 201st motorized uh, division is, you know, 8000 Russian soldiers in southern Tajikistan. And they've been there for years. And they're there ostensibly to protect. Uh, and there, there's many reasons why I think they're there. But in recent years, they've been there ostensibly to protect the Tajik Afghan border. Well, if you are China and you've been relying on Russia's security guarantees and you look at the performance of the Russian troops in Ukraine, I don't think this is much of a security guarantee to anyone. And in fact, I think many of the Central Asian republics have been looking at, at you know, Russia's military performance saying, OK, I mean, we, we're relying on you uh, as a security guarantee for this uh, border, because when the US withdrew, I think many of us thought that there was this vacuum, but there wasn't a vacuum at all. Russia has two military bases, one in, uh, in, in Central Asia, one in Tajikistan, one in Kyrgyzstan. But Russia's military performance has not been, uh, you know, giving any of the republics a lot of uh, faith. Um, we're seeing increased pressure on in Tajikistan for military conscription. We're seeing, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, the Uzbek military, I think, is seeing a, um, a resurgence, uh, you know, greater investment. So I do think this, as uh, Nigel says, a watershed. That was the word I was sort of fumbling for, but you have found it. It is a watershed. I think it's going to change especially looking at Russia's poor performance is really causing the Central Asian republics, which many perceive as quite weak, right? Um, to understand their own internal, both economic, political, and um, social strength they have coming into this. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, fascinating. Um, Dornik and, and, and Dimitar, let me, let me throw in a question from our audience in the mix. Uh, um, how does this uh, situation play with the scramble for energy in the Eastern Mediterranean as countries like Italy try to make up the shortfall of Russian energy? Can Azerbaijan fill the demand gaps and to, to what extent? Um, we're almost at the hour. We are at the hour, so I'll ask you to, uh, okay. to be brief. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, so the, the, the energy question is, uh, of course, for Azerbaijan. Um, Azerbaijan is currently exporting something like 10 billion, billion cubic uh, meters of, of gas to, to, to Europe. And uh, obviously, Azerbaijan is seen as one of the uh, possible, um, uh, the increase of uh, Azerbaijani gas as possible um, uh, ways to, to, to decrease the dependence on Russia. But it will take 
take time. Uh, Azerbaijanis were asked to um, uh, to increase from 10 to 20 billion, uh, and uh, but the capacity of uh, of the of the pipelines is not uh, uh, yet there. But it will increase, and Azerbaijan is uh, quite happy to uh, to to provide more gas to to Europe at the same time. But it also has a political uh, and security dimension because um, uh, the European Union now wants also to be uh, more active in negotiations about the Karabakh and the, the, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And we saw uh, the president, uh, Charles Michel, uh, 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 asking uh, both presidents of our uh, prime minister of Armenia and the president of Azerbaijan to come to Brussels then to discuss the, uh, the, the peace issue. And both, uh, both leaders agreed for different reasons. First, Azerbaijan wants to increase uh, these energy supplies to Europe. So Europe is becoming an interesting partner, more interesting partner. And for Armenia, because they are, um, Armenia has to uh, think about Russia's possible defeat and for Russia's, uh, the, uh, the fact that in 2025, Russian troops might not be in, in Karabakh anymore. So that's why Armenia is also very much interested in increasing uh, the, the 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 role of Europe uh, in the region and uh, to the, the, they they we don't have time unfortunately but there is there are intensive uh, uh, exchange of views between Armenia and Azerbaijan between Armenia and Turkey and all this is the the result of uh, a perceived uh, possible diminution of Russia's role in the region. Thank you, Dimitar. Just to follow up on, on Azerbaijan, yes. uh, in June or maybe later in, in July, the interconnector between Bulgaria and Greece will come on stream. And one billion cubic meters of Azeri gas has been contracted by the Bulgarians. And that's not a vast amount of gas in absolute terms, but for this country, it's one third of its consumption. Um, there will be more interconnectors but, uh, between Greece and Macedonia, maybe Bulgaria, Serbia. The Balkans don't consume that much gas, and even small amounts from Azerbaijan will make a whole lot of difference, which of course will bring uh, leverage to Azerbaijan. So not in EU terms, but in this one part of Europe, uh, Caspian gas will, will make a difference. And because of the political momentum, uh, governments will probably put more effort to, to develop those uh, infrastructure links. Well. We have come to an end. Thank you very much uh, to our speaker, Nigel, here next to me, Jennifer, Dimitar, and, and Tornike. Thank you very much uh, to our audience. I think we have done a very quick but uh, a, a comprehensive survey of the whole Eurasia uh, region. Uh, you will be able to watch a recording of this, of this webinar on our website within, uh, within a day. Thank you very much for now and stay tuned for our event. Goodbye.